This is a Russian nuclear-powered icebreaker heading to rescue a cargo ship that got stuck in the ice of the Arctic Ocean on the northern sea route. During the winter, ice covers almost the entire Arctic Ocean with an average thickness of 2.5 meters, 8 feet, but easily exceeding 3 meters, 10 feet. Not every ship can break through these giant blocks of ice taller than a house to reach these regions, and that's what icebreaker ships were designed for. They enable the rescue of other ships, opening channels, conducting patrols, performing research, and even tourism. A standard cargo ship has a bulbous bow at the front. If it encounters a very thick block of ice, it will hit it head on and not break through. To open a navigable route for them, there is a special type of ship called icebreakers. They break the ice basically in two ways. When the ship comes into frontal contact with an ice block, it applies axial force on it, compressing it. This increases the bending stresses on the ice. If these forces are large enough, it may undergo vertical flexion, meaning it will bend, which is known as buckling. That's because, despite ice being fragile, extensive ice blocks have a certain degree of elastic behavior due to the water molecules, similar to a sheet of metal. If the force applied by the ship's hull on the ice upon frontal contact is sufficient for the ice to bend beyond its elastic limit, it will break. Otherwise, there's a second way to break it which is sliding and riding up with the ship on the ice block. With its weight, an enormous force is applied downward, flexing the ice and breaking it. The force required to crush an ice block head-on is much greater than to break it with the weight of the ship after climbing onto it. Thinner ice plates are usually broken by crushing them head-on. But for thicker ones, which can easily reach 3 meters, 10 feet, it slides and rides up to break with the enormous weight. Sometimes the ship needs to reverse and ride up on the ice a few times until it breaks. For a ship to be considered an icebreaker, it needs to have basically three characteristics. The hull shape to ride up on the ice and break it, a reinforced hull to withstand impacts, and the force of a significant portion of the ship's weight concentrated in that region when it rides up on the ice plates. And lastly, a powerful propulsion system to propel the ship through ice-covered waters. The bulbous bow of conventional cargo ships reduces the resistance of bow waves generated by the ship itself. But icebreakers don't have it, which is not a problem as they navigate more slowly in these waters than in other regions. The resistance of a bulb against the ice in these waters would only increase the final resistance of the ship. Therefore, icebreakers are built without a bulbous bow, and with bow shapes that can be square, which few use, with a V-shape, the oldest, or the most current and efficient, spoon-shaped. Some also have the so-called ice knife under the hull to prevent riding too high on the ice and grounding, as well as helping to cut it. These knives can also be seen on the stern, above the rudders. In icebreakers, the angles between the bow hull and the water line should be as small as possible. Both the angle between the water and the line from the keel to the bow tip, and the angle between the water and the side of the hull. Additionally, the bow tip is usually more rounded, and not as narrow as it was in older designs. Since most of the ice is underwater, with the submerged part being three to four times larger, it becomes relatively easy to slide and ride up on top of it. The rest of the hull has a shape that facilitates the flow of broken ice blocks, preventing them from getting stuck in the propellers or other parts of the ship. But this optimal hull shape for ice reduces its hydrodynamic efficiency in open sea, making it more susceptible, for example, to the impact of waves on the bottom of the hull. Therefore, often the optimal ice design is sacrificed for its operation in open sea. In addition to the specialized hull shape, it also needs to be extremely reinforced. Here we can see the main areas of the hull in contact with the ice, which need to be reinforced. The bow is the region that experiences the highest forces of contact with the ice, followed by the area above and below the waterline. In addition to using thicker steel plates on the hull than a standard ship, the steel must also be high strength, as it becomes more brittle due to temperatures below zero and the high forces applied, making fractures more likely. This occurs mainly in the part of the hull in contact with the air, above the waterline, where the temperature is much lower. The water has an average temperature of minus 1.8 degrees Celsius, or 28.7 Fahrenheit, whereas the air in winter can easily reach minus 25 to minus 35 degrees Celsius, or minus 13 to minus 31 Fahrenheit. Besides that, the hull also features double walls on the bottom and sides, similar to other types of ships. Regarding generation and propulsion, the most used system is diesel-electric, where a diesel engine is coupled to a generator, which powers electric motors that drive the propellers. But there are also those with diesel engines mechanically coupled to the propellers, those powered by natural gas and nuclear-powered ones. Being diesel or gas technically doesn't limit the ship's power, so if nuclear ones are much more expensive to build, why is Russia investing so much in them? 
for autonomy and efficiency. They can go over seven years without refueling, being limited only by the replenishment of food, which lasts around six months, but which can be done by helicopter or other support vessel. This nuclear-powered ship, Arctica, decommissioned in 2008, stayed in service on the ice for 357 days without entering a port once, almost a year. Consider this case. If this 55.2 megawatts Russian nuclear ship were powered by diesel, it would consume over 90.7 metric tons of fuel per day. But since it's nuclear powered, it consumes less than half a kilogram, one pound of uranium on the toughest day, while breaking ice nearly three meters, 10 feet thick at a constant speed. This means that more powerful ships can be built without carrying a huge weight of fuel and without compromising autonomy. This is a big advantage, considering the difficulty of refueling in such a hostile and hard to reach scenario. And although uranium and engine construction are expensive, in the end nuclear power turns out to be much more economical. Now let's make a comparison to see how powerful icebreakers are. This giant container ship with a displacement of 251,000 tons when fully loaded, which is its weight with cargo, has a propulsion power of 59.36 megawatts and a maximum speed of 43 kilometers per hour or 26 miles per hour. This nuclear-powered icebreaker ship from Russia, currently the most powerful in the world, with a displacement of 33,530 tons and capable of breaking ice up to 3 meters thick, 10 feet, while maintaining a constant speed, has a power of 60 megawatts and can reach 41 kilometers per hour, 25 miles per hour. So their speed and power are practically the same. The difference is that the icebreaker applies all that force to break the ice and the container ship to transport all that cargo. This one, one of the largest diesel-powered icebreakers, has a power of 44.8 megawatts and can break ice over 1.8 meters thick, 6 feet, while in motion, and reach 33 kilometers per hour, 21 miles per hour. Currently there are icebreakers with one or two thrusters mounted on the bow hull, working as both a propeller and an ice chopper. They chop up the already broken ice blocks to reduce friction on the hull. The thrusters designed for this purpose are much more robust than conventional ones to withstand the impacts of the propeller on the ice, in addition to being more powerful. They can rotate 360 degrees around the vertical axis, which is why they're called azimuth thrusters, also eliminating the need for a rudder. In some models, the motor is inside the ship. In others called azipods, the motor, in this case electric, is housed in an external sealed pod, directly connected to the propeller. A smaller motor is used to enable the 360 degree rotation. This maneuverability is crucial in moments when the ship may become nearly stationary, a situation where the rudder isn't very useful. Another system with a similar function is the bow thruster, those fixed and embedded in the hull. Many also have pneumatic hull washing, an air bubble generation system to lubricate and reduce friction between the hull and the ice. Low pressure compressed air is pumped through holes in the bottom of the hull. As the bubbles rise along the hull, they expand and create a strong current of air and seawater between the hull and the ice, pushing the ice blocks away from the ship's hull and reducing friction. A considerable amount of air is pumped. Most of the time this air is at ambient temperature, but it can also be warm. In addition to reducing the resistance between the hull and the ice, it also helps prevent the formation of ice at the waterline because it rises with the bubbling, as well as generating a spray of water, which helps melt the ice. And if for some reason the ship becomes stationary, at sea or in a dock, the water around it can freeze and trap the ship. This system can be left on to prevent this, or, once frozen, after 10 to 20 minutes of being turned on, the ship can already move. And as the systems on both sides of the ship are independent, they can even be used as lateral thrusters. The bow thruster can also be used to generate waves and push the ice away from the hull, either replacing the bubble generation system or further enhancing this protective channel. Some cargo ships use the concept of double acting ship, where they navigate in reverse with the stern forward. To do this, they need to have a reinforced hull to withstand the impacts of the ice and a stern shape to break the ice. They must also have azimuth thrusters at the rear. With this setup, the turbulence generated by the propellers has the same effect as the air bubble system, and they also chip away at smaller blocks of broken ice. Conventional thrusters operating in reverse could also be used, but the propellers are typically designed either for pulling, which is more common, or pushing. If used in reverse, it won't have the same efficiency. For now, this double action concept is only applied in regions with ice ranging from 1.5 to 2 meters thick, 4.9 to 6.5 feet, 
Beyond that, only with icebreakers. Most icebreakers operate head-on, but there are so-called oblique icebreakers. These are ships with an asymmetrical hull that can also break the ice with the ship at an angle or completely sideways. This allows it to open a passage up to 50 meters wide, 164 feet, much larger than the 25 meters, 82 feet, of standard icebreakers, allowing the passage of much larger vessels. However, at an angle, this Baltica model can break ice with a thickness of only up to 60 centimeters, 2 feet. When facing forward or backward, it can break ice of over 1 meter, 3.3 feet. It has three azimuth thrusters, like the ones we saw earlier, allowing it to move in any direction. And finally, the equipment and machinery must be designed to operate in below zero temperatures or be protected to prevent freezing. With ice becoming increasingly thinner in recent years, many transportation companies are showing interest in routes through the Arctic Ocean. There are two main routes. One is the Northwest Passage, which passes through Alaska and Arctic Archipelago of Canada, connecting the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. The United States and Canada already have access to both oceans, but the route shortens the distance between Asia and Europe compared to the Suez Canal route. The journey between Yokohama in Japan and the Port of London is about 11,400 nautical miles through the Suez Canal, and 8,600 nautical miles through the Northwest Passage, reducing travel time from 31 days and 16 hours to just 24 days assuming a speed of 15 knots. The other is the Northern Sea Route, through the northern part of Russia. It reduces the distance between some regions of Asia and Europe by about 40% compared to the Suez Canal Route. Considering the same route as before, between Yokohama and London, it reduces from 11,400 nautical miles through the Suez Canal to only 7,200 nautical miles through the Northern Sea Route, lowering travel time from 31 days and 16 hours to just 20 days. This route is usually open for 8 to 10 months of the year, but in February 2021, a commercial ship crossed it in winter for the first time with the assistance of a Russian nuclear icebreaker. This happened largely because that year the Arctic reached record lows in ice coverage. On one hand, this led to the longest period the route remained open, but on the other hand, it served as a warning of global warming. The Ever Given incident, which became stuck blocking the Suez Canal in early 2021, has drawn even more attention to Arctic routes. Added to this is the interest in approximately 13% of the world's oil and 30% of the world's gas that has not yet been discovered, according to estimates from the United States Geological Survey. In addition to minerals such as gold, silver, titanium, graphite, and uranium present in the depths of the Arctic Ocean, those interested are countries with coastlines along the Arctic Ocean, such as the United States, Canada, Russia, Norway, and Denmark, and even others without coastal access, such as China, Japan, and South Korea. It's worth noting that apart from each country's territorial waters, most of the Arctic Ocean is considered international waters, for now. China even presented plans for a polar silk road in 2017. Meanwhile, Russia aims to have between 20 and 30 percent of its oil production come from the Arctic by 2050. It's no wonder that Russia's fleet of icebreakers is the largest in the world. From what I've checked, currently it has 72 of them in operation, with seven being nuclear-powered. It has more than all other countries combined. But this list also includes ships that break ice with a little less than one meter thick. And of course, the fleet even has some ships from the 1960s and 70s, but they are all in operation. But with so many, some break down and are repaired only after a few years, resulting in the fleet varying considerably, in addition to constant buying and selling of ships. Russia has been significantly increasing its fleet in recent years, with currently 21 under construction, including four nuclear ones, in addition to one nuclear ship that has not yet started construction and two planned gas-powered ships. The latest nuclear icebreakers produced, known as Project 22220, are the largest and most powerful in the world currently. They have a shaft power of 60 megawatts and are capable of breaking ice up to 3 meters thick, 10 feet, at a constant speed of 3.7 kilometers per hour, 2.3 miles per hour. The first of them was named Arctica, the same name as that nuclear icebreaker which was decommissioned in 2008. They are also building a new class of these nuclear icebreakers, much larger and with 120 megawatts of shaft power, twice the current most powerful. It will be 10 times stronger than this diesel-powered icebreaker, also Russian. It will be called Project 105010. As you heard the guy, it will be able to break ice up to 4.1 meters thick, 13.4 feet, at a constant speed of 3.7 kilometers per hour, 2.3 miles per hour. Try to imagine the size of a block of ice with that thickness. The ceiling height of your house should be around 2.8 meters, 9.2 feet. And if it performs that maneuver of reversing and advancing, a few times over the ice, it can break even thicker ice. It's going to be a beast. 
Canada comes next with 13 heavy and medium icebreakers in operation, in addition to 9 light ones, plus 2 under construction and 2 more planned. Finland has 11 icebreakers in operation. China has 8 in total, 3 of which are heavy, with another heavy under construction, but its ambitions in the Arctic are big, and it has already announced that it is developing its own nuclear icebreaker. This is likely to concern not only the US, but also Russia, which despite some partnerships between them, ultimately Russia does not want its dominance in the Arctic threatened. Sweden has five icebreakers in operation. The United States currently has one heavy icebreaker, the USCGC Polar Star, which entered service in 1976 and is about to retire, and one medium icebreaker, the USCGC Healy, commissioned in 99. They also have three others with less icebreaking capabilities, but they have already expressed concerns about Russia's and China's advances in the Arctic, having planned to build an additional three heavy and three medium icebreakers. There are also several other countries with fewer ships, such as Norway, Estonia, Latvia, the UK, France, Germany, Austria, Spain, Italy, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, South Africa, Japan, South Korea, Australia, Chile, Argentina, and Brazil, which is building one for ice up to one meter. So what do you think about these machines and how they work? Would you be willing to go on a multi-month trip in one of them? Thank you for your company and until next time.